gives out the grants and they primarily we're trying to knock down this wall, which is an example of this course. Um, uh, we're part of the NIH Clinical Center in Bethesda and I don't know, yesterday probably or everybody went to have pizza or so, but uh, there's a new documentary on Discovery Channels. It started last night at 9 p.m. It's called House of Hope. It's now I think a three-part documentary series about the NIH Clinical Center and it's about um, as the House of Hope, it's called First in Human and uh, it's about um, uh, first in human clinical trials at the NIH Clinical Center. So go check that out um, to uh, see a little bit what's going on at the, at the clinical center. So my topic is the safety perspective of drugs and I always have the feeling talking about safety and FDA always um, you know, gets you know, the air out of the room and you know, the, the enthusiasm that's there. It's that it's always, it's, it's, you know, we always feel like a party pooper to, to, to talk about aspects like that and often in uh, you know, my own background, um, you, know, you learn from your own um, uh, mistakes and you learn from your own um, um, background. I myself was a um, participant in this course in 2009 and I remember um, I already had a clinical trial going on at that moment. I'm a movement disorder neurologist doing research on tremor and alcohol is really uh, effective in tremor as, 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 as clinically known. So there's, there are alcohol-like substances. One is Octanol and aging on alcohol has been used as a food, sub food supplement and we did a trial on that, it's been used widely um, otherwise and uh, it was, um, so humans had that before, we were able to get that through the FDA and there was a very old paper that different isomers of octanol are even more effective than, than the one that we used and I came in with that trial uh, to the Vail course I was very excited to have an even better octanol than, than the one that we were already studying and one of my mentors was Rusty Katz the, the, um, uh, the previous division leader of the Division of Neurology Products uh, at FDA, and he just said, mm, "No, no, um, you know, have you looked at you know the safety of all that?" So, you know, there's they gave that to mice, and it's equally effective, even better than the one that I studied. And said, "Yeah, oh, sure, uh, but you know, what about the safety of this? Right? It should be fine, I guess." Um, uh, and then you know, next steps were you know a whole letter by the FDA. Um, going back to our um, to, to collaborators that do uh, animal work on that and to actually reproduce you know, these findings that we had before, did, did some dose exploration around our, our, our interest in dosing. Turns out that at the dose that were described so gratefully in that other paper, um, you know, the mice also basically stopped moving at all. So it turns out um, uh, there was a reason um, so that um, eventually it never moved forward, so I probably would not get the distinction on my course, <laughs> but at least I had. <laughs> This is All right, um, I have nothing to disclose, unfortunately. Um, I'm a government employee, so why do we not clinical safety testing? And uh, this was probably my, my example is not was not that of a disaster, other than you know maybe a little bit for my career, not really. But this was a, actually a, a, a disaster um, that was mentioned at the very beginning. I think Eric also already mentioned that in his talk. Um, uh, there is um, in the 30s next year, um, sulfonilamide disaster uh, of 1937 and 1937. Uh, uh, this is a drug that was formulated and marketed as an antimicrobial drug um, and uh, as a, um, uh, by a small company and it was blended with a, with a, with a raspberry flavor. And um, at that time, the nephrotoxicity of that compound has been described, but company scientists just didn't know about that. And um, they, um, at that time, no required preclinical testing was necessary, and over 100 people in 15 states that were exposed died as a consequence of that exposure. That led to a JAM article uh, in 1938, which basically, um, I have that issue every year, but this is not displaying well. Anyhow, so that paper uh, laid out very specific recommendations what should be done um, in order of, uh, in, in, in terms of preclinical uh, testing uh, to uh, ensure the safety of compounds. It's a, it's a list of, of, of several points, uh, one to nine, and they are basically still in place today and uh, they have been put together and formed and, and put together as the food and what eventually became the Food and Drug uh, Cosmetics Act of 1938 and that basically introduced a mandate um, of uh, preclinical safety testing and the FDA's authority to review. So, um, and that's translated up until uh, today when you fill out the FDA form 1571 as an, as an, spot, as a, as an IND sponsor, there are these checkboxes way down the list that um, are, um, uh, are 
relevant here, and that's chemistry, manufacturing, and control data, and then also pharmacology and toxicology uh, data. So what should I know about my drugs? So if you go out there and if you submit uh, this 1571, if you submit your study, if you want to become an IND sponsor, um, so what is chemistry, manufacturing, control? How do you answer this question when you check this checkbox? So uh, a drug product is uh, not only composed of your actual drug substance, it's also excipients, um, impurities in the container. So you probably need to, need to uh, know about, about all these aspects that are in, the drug, uh, are, are in your final drug product that you administer to humans. Um, you um, want to know and you want to have data on the identity and the strength, the purity and also the quality of your drug. We had yesterday discussions about you know, how does it, what if your drug sits on the shelf for two hours or three hours? constituted by the, by, the, by the pharmacy, for example. How stable is that? Um, and, and you should answer these questions, not by guesses, but often, you know, you have to have a research pharmacist that helps you answer these questions and actually maybe do some tests before you um, submit your drug to the FDA. Um, um, and you want to have additional information on the manufacturer. FDA can come in and look at your manufacturing um, um, facility, for example, look whether your manufacturer is following uh, um, uh, GMP, for example, storage stability, etc. etc. Um, what about pharmacology and toxicology? Um, so, so this is about um, so data that you should uh, have or, or you should know about is the pharmacological effect and the, me and the mechanism. Usually, that's um, in drugs that have never exposed or been, been given to humans before, um, out of animal models. And there's this ACME acronym, and this is about the, the absorption, the distribution, the metabolism, and the excretion. As a clinician and also as a biostatistician, this is something that's very far away from our area of expertise. But if you are giving a drug um, um, into humans for the first time, uh, you should have either somebody who works with you on that, or you should have data that provides that. And that's usually something that you don't often find in, 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 in the public, in, in the literature. So this is something where often you know, collaborations are necessary. And this can also sometimes be costly if, if, if work is necessary. Toxicology. Toxicology can be acute toxicology, that's often enough for your first uh, study, uh, but then also subacute or chronic over the long term if you expose uh, animals. Um, safety pharmacology persistence might be necessary. Is there any concern in the cardiovascular system, the CNS system, etc.? Are there any special toxicology tests necessary for, for your both uh, for administration? We're talking about the study on nasal administration, for example. Do you need any specific toxicology? Data on that genetic toxicity, for example. Um, these are tests that are often in vitro. Um, so uh, that sounds overwhelming and um, uh, should not be a showstopper uh, when you when, when when you think you have the the, 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 the best drug that goes into humans for the first time. Um, the, the 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 point to make here is that um, preclinical is not ending uh, once you go into clinical phase. And actually. If you go to the FDA, the, 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 the chief reviewer for pharmacology and toxicology, she would slap you around the head if you use the word preclinical. Pre -clinical. She says, um, this is not preclinical, as we say non-clinical. And the reason for that is, is that preclinical, as I said, does not stop with your phase one. Um, and thankfully, it doesn't stop, because as I said, if this all you know, gene tox, chronic tox would be required uh, for your ID opening study, you won't be able to get off ground very early. So for phase one, often very circumscribed requirements are in place um, to, to, show, to show data, and these are usually acute toxicology, some pharmacology, and your chemistry information. Once it goes beyond phase one, uh, much more might be necessary. If you um, start your IND with a single dose uh, administration um, study, maybe multiple dose, a few doses escalation study, uh, that might be fine if you have acute toxicology data. Once you want to give it for three months, six months, a year, um, if they might come back and say, oh, what, you know, do we have data? This, how, how about the safety if you give it if you, if you give it for a long time? Alternate formulations, for example, if you change for your formulation, you might update. You might need to update your IND package. Reproductive toxicology, for example, if you, if you want to give it into, into um, if you want to give it to certain populations. Additional safety pharmacology might be necessary. So this is all the non-clinical development goes goes well beyond your clinical phase, even, even post-approval. Uh, so so non-clinical aspects are really, really important for you if you become um, an, an ID sponsor. Why it's right relevant? Because again, it's, um, you know, it can stop your development program well into the clinical phase. And an example of this here is the Huntington study. It was published very nicely um, uh, a few years ago. 
uh, with, with, um, with, a, with a prominent publication of a phase two randomized double blind placebo controlled trial, and this was the same intolerability study, and they were moving into phase three. This was a company sponsored um, compound. And, um, and usually what happens at the end of phase two, um, uh, there's an interaction with, with, with the FDA, and there's when you go into phase three, you, usually the FDA should uh, you know, look at your protocol to say that you know, do we agree on, on an outcome that could be then approvable down the line. What happened is that uh, FDA reviewed the phase three protocol, and then they said you can't really read that, but it says upon review, the FDA has issued a partial clinical hold letter based on non clinical um, animal findings, uh, which cur uh, currently limit. Uh, the dose of uh, PVD2 uh, that can be given to patients uh, with Huntington's disease. So basically, they were going in with the phase three um, protocol that um, basically suggested a dose that was higher than they could prove in their animal models um, to be safe. So basically, they put it on partial hold, meaning you have to stop your escalation at that point. The company, I think, eventually decided that um, uh, uh, this was not worthwhile going forward because this, were the, you know, this, this was in the range of what they hoped would be clinically than, than, than meaningful, you know, the alternative would have been to, you know, to further study that in, in, in animal models. So, so that you know, non-clinical aspects can stop you all the way at the end of phase two. Um, so why do we need non-clinical data? Um, is it safe to put um, the drug candidate into humans? Um, what isn't safe? What is a safe dose for human clinical trials? What is, well, this is about your starting dose and also your end dose. You want to know what the dose-limiting toxicities are not because um, to make a decision whether or not you want to do it, it's really about, and that's what FDA really is looking for, so what, you sh what should you be monitoring for in a clinical trial? You should be aware of that. So if somebody says, great, we did an NTD study and we had no toxicity at all, at all uh, to the highest dose, that's bad news because you don't know what's going what's to happen in vulnerable populations. Right? You have no idea what, what, what side effects you should be monitoring for. Um, and what are potential toxicities that cannot um, be identified in clinical trials. So, um, quick jump into the regulatory view. Um, let's say you have an off-the-shelf um, uh, drug that is FDA approved. You can usually assume that this drug product meets animal tox toxicology standards for the maximum approved dose um, according to the label. Um, if, um, so you might not need any additional data. So if there's a label and you use it within the label, um, then, then um, you can assume that, that this meets uh, the, the, the FDA standards. If you, however, give a higher dose, or give it for a longer time, different formulation, change the formulation of your change route of administration, uh, then additional studies may be necessary. Um, uh, also, if you look at different patient populations, um, uh, that might change your risk benefit ratio. And often, you know, the issue can also be, oh, I'm going in with a population that is, you know, much, you know, less much healthier, you know, this has been improved in cancer patients and I'm going in with you know, patients with migraine or something like that. So that changes your risk benefit ratio also in the sense that the higher risks of the drugs might be uh, less acceptable in a, in a, in, in a population that is, that, is, that is not as sick, for example, as the, as the population that's been improved in. So just the fact that, that, that your, um, your population may be healthier than the one that is approved might not um, be, uh, you know, might, might be a problem as well. Uh, so you have to argue the risk of the benefit ratio. If um, you, com you combine drugs, FDA might um, uh, want to look at not only the single um, administration toxicity, but also what happens if you give that together. If, this, if you give that together, also in animal, animal models, for example. Um, if you use um, the drug exactly as marketed from its formulation, then basically the, the label should be sufficient. Um, if you um, get a drug from, a, from another sponsor. Let's say you, the, the drug company agrees to, to donate you know, a certain you know, number of drugs for you uh, to administer in your study. Um, uh, then, um, then, uh, and then you're not the IND sponsor, or you are the IND sponsor, but the drug is manufactured by, by a company. You can obtain a letter that allows the reference to another IND. So that also can be a drug that is under uh, investigation by a company, for example. They agree to share that with you. They might give you a letter of cross-reference, and um, basically that. So this way, the company does not disclose their proprietary information to you, but basically lets, allows the FDA to go over in their ID uh, package and look at look at their um, their preclinical data. Um, it must support, however, um, your planned dose and your route of administration. Dietary supplements. Um, an important point. 
Um, dietary supplements are not approved drugs and they don't have approved safe doses. Um, so that's, um, uh, uh, so, so, so therefore you cannot assume non-clinical um, that basically this is a safe drug because you know, it's, a dietary, it's a dietary supplement. The FDA might actually ask you um, to, to also look at, look at, look at um, non-clinical aspects there. Uh, the point here is that the use um, in your trial makes it to a drug most likely. So even if it's a dietary supplement, if it falls under the IND regulations, the use uh, of it is uh, the use of a drug, so it's basically um, it has to meet the same standards as, as other pharmaceutical uh, agents. So that can be actually a disadvantage uh, because, uh, because it's not an approved drug. Um, if um, you make your investigational drug yourself or your research pharmacists, uh, then it generally must uh, comply with the full set of, 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 of um, um, uh, non clinical pharmacology and toxicology. Um, then basically they, they will be looking, looking for that. Um, how to pick a starting dose? Uh, you might not need additional long clinical data uh, if there is an approved um, dosing range that is available. If you have data um, uh, that might be from the literature, that might be from collaborators, from, from, from collaborators um, that support your dose range and duration of exposure and the mode of administration, this might be animal or, or human studies. Um, a caveat, often publications don't contain the, F the information that the FDA is looking for. Um, this is, um, uh, this um, you know, kind of the line, you know, no adverse events were found, um, is often not sufficient. So FDA wants to often see, to, to see information about, you know, how many animals have been exposed to humans, what are the doses, the durations, the exposure, the mode of administration. So, so if, 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 if the publication that you submit as, as, as evidence that this has been given to humans before, it's not acceptable, before, it's not acceptable to the FDA try to get the data sets, try to get uh, to reach out to the authors, maybe, maybe that can be helpful because these are often information that are not, um, that are not conveyed in these, in these publications. So um, uh, if there's no previous human experience, uh, you can calculate uh, your safe starting dose if you have appropriate animal studies. Uh, uh, with 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 a few steps, and um, that might uh, 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 that might help you also if you get data from from your, your industry partner, for example, that gives you a drug to to um, to calculate um, your safe starting dose. There's a nice uh, guidance um, by the FDA that I would recommend going through. These are only a few pages to to walk you can, to kind of through the concept. How do you how do you extrapolate from hum from animals to humans? Very briefly, the first step is to define the no adverse uh, no observed uh, adverse effect level, the NOEL, and that's the highest dose level that does not produce a significant increase in adverse effects in comparison to the control group. So um, uh, that's basically a benchmark um, for safety from appropriate animal studies, and uh, that's basically your starting 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 point. Um, and you take this no observed adverse event level and you can calculate that to a human equivalent dose. And this guidance that I showed you has this nice table that you can go back to with, with some conversion factors. So if it's been derived out of you know, certain animal studies, you can, you can, you can, you can cross-calculate the number. And, um, and uh, this is based on body surface area and it's going to assume that these toxic endpoints um, are, uh, are assumed to scale well um, when we normalize it by body surface area. And you can calculate um, the human equivalence um, dose with, with these um, scaling factors. So, and then you um, have to decide which species to select. If you have more than one species, um, um, well, which one do you select? Uh, factors that you want to consider is what species comes as closest to humans in terms of um, its absorption, distribution, metabolism, and excretion. What is most predictive for human um, toxicities? Um, for biologics, does the model express the relevant um, receptors or epitopes? Um, uh, in the absence of uh, data uh, on any species with relevance, you go for the lowest um, human equivalent dose. Step four is then the safety factor, um, and that's basically your margin of safety. Um, to, um, to protect human subjects um, for the initial to this uh, starting dose. Um, and it allows also for variability in your, ex in, in your extrapolation. Your deep default um, uh, safety factor is 10. So if you calculate the human equivalent dose, you select the right um, species. You, if you don't have any other information, the standard is you divide that dose by 10 and there's your, um, sorry, uh, there's your starting dose. You might increase the safety factor, for example, if um, 
you have non-monitorable toxicities, if you have toxicities without any pre-monetary signs. Uh, you can also decrease your safety factor if, 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 if the class of the agent, for example, is well known, um, and you can easily monitor these um, toxicities. And the, the last step is then your pharmacologically active dose that you want to define, and that's basically the lowest dose that is tested in animals with the intended pharmacological activity. So, so that's really um, the fact if, um, if you have pharmacodynamic studies in animals, so once you have your maximum recommended starting dose and your pharmacologically active dose is actually lower than that, you want to go for this one. So as an example, let's say you um, have non-clinical toxicology studies and uh, you determine an oil of 15 milligram per kilogram in dogs, 50 milligram per kilogram in rats, and 50 milligram per kilogram in monkeys. Um, next step, you convert it to the human equivalent dose using um, the, the, uh, the conversion factors, and we divide it by the conversion factors that are listed here. For example, here the dog, we divide it, it comes to 8 milligram per kilogram, um, the, the rats to eight, also to 8 milligram per uh, kilogram, and then the monkey uh, would uh, correspond to 16 milligram per kilogram, uh, per kilogram in, in humans. So the appropriate human equivalence dose is therefore 8 milligram per kilogram, it's the lowest of, of these two. With the, we um, apply a safety factor of 10, so basically your maximum recommended um, starting dose um, in human would be 0.8 milligram per kilogram. So this is how you basically translate this animal data over into kind of a, a well-justified maximum recommended starting dose. What are the limitations? Of course, this is an algorithm, it's very mechanical. Um, uh, it's toxicity focused, less, less pharmacology based. It does not uh, address the dose escalation part of it. Um, you know, you can't say anything about locally administered drugs um, if, if, if these were all systemically uh, administered drugs. And again, this is not really applicable to biologics. If you work with, with biologics, Often, you know, no real um, doses can be defined in, in animals um, uh, and um, there is a minimum anticipated biological effect level that's a complete uh, different ballpark to, to, to get to that dose. There's a very nice guidance by the FDA on that. I would I recommend looking at that if you're working with biologics. So what this is all about, this is not only about getting you going, uh, you know, making sure that you, know, you have a well-defined, well-justified Dose, uh, but this is also then uh, about uh, this basically sets the stage for your clinical safety monitoring in your trial. So although your your um, starting dose might be you know justified well, um, you know you might still get into hot water with the FDA if you don't have the safety monitoring procedures in place. So basically, any safety signal uh, observed uh, in these non compliance studies you should monitor for clinically. And, and these are really the make or break moments of, of, of INDs, um, the, the, the safety monitoring procedures. And we should be vigilant about the unknown. Why? Um, because we know that not everything that comes out of animal toxicity is actually um, uh, explaining everything that we can expect in humans. Um, so there's data that the positive concordance rate between observed animal and human toxicity is, is, is at around 70%. So 30% of human toxicities are actually not uh, predicted, and um, if you look at um, most of the data here, so for example, the animal models, the dog model, for example, is much better predictive uh, than the mouse model, which is really not really predictive in terms of toxicity. So, if your non-clinical work is really limited to mouse, you can't really see anything about the, about the predictive uh, part um, for for safety monitoring. On the left, uh, we see here on the top um, uh, adverse events that uh, basically we. Um, we, we, we usually see humans not really see in animals a lot, or whether the human model is more predictive than the animal model, um, while you know, gastrointestinal vomiting, for example, in the middle there, you know, this is kind of equally predictive both in humans and also in, in animals. Um, to summarize, um, if human data is lacking, um, non clinical data is absolutely crucial um, for your dose selection, for your safety monitoring, and also to meet um, regulatory requirements. Um, human data maybe more valuable non-clinical data. So if you have good data uh, out of you know, um, well-reported um, other phase one or so studies that support your data that you might get around, not having to show additional manual data. Um, because non-clinical experiments are usually expensive and, um, and you know, could require additional you know, work, additional grants, additional money that's usually then have to go out of your hands 
and then eventually go back into your hands once that's been done. So you, so, so you want to um, engage in these thoughts early on when you design your study. You usually don't need to worry if your compound is FDA approved um, and used within the limitations of the label. Um, and with that, kind of end with a little shout out to our own. Um, we have a fellowship at, um, at, at, at NIDS together with Robin Conwit and also with the FDA, John Marler from the FDA, where we have fellows can you know, rotate through NIDS and also spend a full year with the FDA, we, we, uh, become part of review teams to learn all that from, from the other side of the curtain. So if there's anybody in your institution that might be interested, um, let us know. With that, I say thank you.